So, it's Monday evening. Tonight I want to talk about two benchmarks that were published just last week. They are very similar in some way and I think this might be the future of how we benchmark Frontier's model. Let's start with the first one, it's called Gaia. It's a general, it's a benchmark for general AI systems. It's a collaboration between FAIR, one of my team at Huggy Face, Clementino, and also AutoGPT, Greg Swift. This benchmark is here to investigate general assistance, which is it's pretty clear today that in the future we'll have AI that are able to do many things for us, right? That are able to go on the web, to take a look at picture, to hear a sound, and to combine all these sorts of information, plus some reflection, some coding, to give us the answer to the question that we're asking, okay? Let's say I'm listening to radio, hear the sound of a band, the AI can also hear this name um, and can basically take a look on the web and add this to my Spotify. Gaia takes this to a much higher level. There is three levels in Gaia. Level three is almost impossible for GPT for today. Level one has 30% success. Level one, an example of question of level one is like this, okay? What was the actual enrollment count of the clinical trial on H. pylori in acne vulgaris patients from January to May 2018 as listed on the NIH website? The model needs to be able to go on the web, find the NIH website, look at for the, the, the right clinical trial and basically find the answer, okay? Not so difficult. Now, level three is a whole other story. Here is a level three question. In NASA's astronomy picture of the day in 2006, January 21, two astronauts are visible. A large one, a small one. Take the smallest one, find the astronauts' groups that it was a member of, and find in his group which astronauts spend the least amount of time in space. Now give me the number of minutes rounded to the nearest minute. This is a question with only just one factual answer, no ambiguity. It's not super complex to understand, any human can do that, but it's very difficult. Level GPT-4 has almost zero level of success there, okay? The idea is to take these fundamental, is to test these fundamental capabilities without any ambiguity. GPQA is the second benchmark. Also 30% success of GPT-4, almost the same number of questions, 450. Also a name, with, which is an acronym starting with a G on four letters. That's all the, all the similarities. Other than that, it's very different. And the reason GPT-4 find this, this, this uh, benchmark very difficult is that it's designed to be at the limit of human knowledge, okay? This is a data set where each question was created by someone who has a PhD in physics, chemistry, or biology. And these questions are all crafted so that a non-expert will get will won't be able to get to the to the right answer, right? But these are still questions that are at the limit of knowledge so that there can be another PhD student pair that can check. And for each case, there were at least one other expert who checked that the answer was true. So the same, in both of these cases, we have factually true answers, okay? But here, give me, let me give you an example. These are very different type of an answer. Let's take uh, quantum mechanics because that's what I used to do before AI. Like suppose we have a depolarizing channel operation given by E, the probability of the depolarization state represents the strength of the noise. If the cross operator of the given states are, here the set of cross operator equation, what could be the correct cross representation of the state? This is a very complex one. And the reason this question I designed so is that this benchmark, the goal is not to test the general AI assistant, it's to test narrow superhuman AI. Okay. These are AI which will be better than human at some task. We already have that with, for instance, Go, right? But we may have that soon as well for like physics discovery, right? What happens if the AI creates a new physics theory? How can you check this is true? We have, a we have a set of theories, we have like debates, we have some ideas on how to check and design this, but we need a benchmark to be able to benchmark these theories. We need a benchmark to be able to test what is called scalable, scalable oversight. And this is the idea of this benchmark, okay? In both cases, this is a small set of questions, 450, carefully designed one by one by humans, carefully crafted one by one. They are almost impossible to memorize, okay? And also impossible to find by a simple Google search. And in all of these cases, I would say memorization has 
make no sense because the answer is not what's important. It's not, you know, what was the name of this astronaut that's important. It's not what is the cross operator that's important. What will be important for us will be how the model, what is the trace, how the model reason and use the tools to be able to reach to this end, to reach this answer, okay? Uh, in both cases also, we are in huge combinator of spaces. Here, we're exploring the web, we're using tools. This is just huge combinator of space of action. The model can do a lot of things. The same here, we're in the full combinatorial space of human knowledge theory, okay? Everything is possible, basically. This is really where we want to test the models now, because pure memorization doesn't really make any more sense to test, okay? And I think in both cases, what I like the most and what I love the most is that these are open source, openly shared benchmark with the communities. Not something that's just de developed in private lab, right? But things that we'll be able to use as common grounds to compare various models together, okay? And things that we'll be able to build upon. So that's what made me maybe the most excited about these two new papers.